Pliny uh, talking about a decade and a half of the Anglo-Australian planet searching. Thanks, Matthew. So, um, what I'd like to tell you about this morning, um, I'm a bit of an interloper. Due to an early flight on Friday morning, I couldn't talk with the other planet searching people, so I'm stuck in here with the characterization people. It's about what we've learnt from, from 15 years of running the Anglo-Australian planet search at the Anglo-Australian Telescope. Um, I'm also going to um, use this as a shameless opportunity to plug the posters by the various members of our team at the University of New South Wales. Uh, you can see all their, uh, their faces down there. Um, many of them are here at this meeting. Uh, and so if you see them standing next to a poster, go up and say hello. They're, they're mostly a pretty friendly mob. So the Anglo-Australian Planet Search has been running since about 1998 when Paul Butler uh, first came out to the AAO uh, and started the program. Uh, although three years later he decamped back to the, um, the land of the brave and the home of the free. Uh, and uh, the program continued on though with a, a substantial team, uh, many of whom have, uh, have been uh, running it, the program ever since. Um, I've shown a sort of a plot of the, the number of nights that we've had on the AAT uh, over the course of time. Uh, the nice thing about being on a four metre telescope is that as eight metre telescopes have become available, getting time on four metre telescopes has become easier to do. Uh, and so for many years we were getting uh, on the order of uh, around about 50 nights uh, per year uh, to, to carry out this program. Uh, and indeed in some years we were even able to convince the time allocation committee uh, to do uh, what we could uh, thought was an important project to uh, essentially get 48 consecutive nights of telescope time, so that was two bright lunations and all the dark time in between, in order to really bang away at some of our most stable stars to look for short period planets. Uh, that's one of the things that we've learnt uh, after running the same program for uh, 15 years, is, is that um, time allocation committees unfortunately um, have the attention span of sparrows, uh, and uh, so they need to see something bright and shiny continuously being put in front of them. So like Madonna, you have to continually reinvent yourself uh, over the course of that time. Uh, and indeed, uh, over the last couple of years, we had a gap where they got bored and we've now managed to convince them to let us uh, continue on with a slightly different strategy that, that I'll mention uh, a little in a moment. But the one thing we have been doing different from almost all of the other planet searches is that whereas most of the other planet searches, as more telescope time has become available, have started to look at more and more stars, we've actually stuck with more or less the same sample of 240 stars uh, throughout uh, the entire program. Uh, and that means that although we are not looking at a very large sample of stars, we do actually have a quite a detailed amount of information on them. Uh, and now that we're 15 years in, uh, the next sort of five to six years will be telling us a lot about the presence of Jupiter analogues uh, around those stars. So gas giant planet in planets in Jupiter-like orbits at, uh, at sort of beyond 12-year periods. Uh, and indeed, that's the focus of the, the planet search from now on. We've, we've cut our sample back to the, the 123 most stable stars uh, that, we, uh, that we have found over the course of the program and we're exclusively concentrating on them to try and find long period planets. Uh, these observations are not being carried out on an ultra stabilized spectrograph. They're being carried out on uh, a, a rather nice spectrograph for its time but a rather crappy spectrograph nowadays, the, the University College London Shell spectrograph. Um, it varies with temperature and pressure. Our shellogram moves around on the detector by, by pixels per night. Uh, but nonetheless, by the use of a, an iodine cell to calibrate the system, we've been able to get a long-term precision of two and a half meters per second. And indeed, when we actually went and banged away at those really dense, uh, densely sampled, very bright, the most stable stars in what we called our rocky planet search campaigns for 48 contiguous nights, we were able to push the precision down to them uh, to under two meters a second. So here's where we sit. This is a plot I made up a couple of years ago, um, but uh, the situation hasn't changed dramatically since then. In the sort of the global planet hunt, one of the things that because we've been continuously monitoring the same stars over and over again, that we're best at is actually looking for finding long period planets. And indeed, when I made this plot, uh, we had uh, the largest fraction in terms of long period planets uh, out of the planets we've found of any of the planet searches. And that's the strength that we're going to be pushing into in the future. So as is usual, here's a, a sort of selection of the highlights of what we've found. 
over the last uh, 15 years. Um, there's between 40 or 45 planets that have come out of this search, depending on how you count the ones that have been discovered together with, with other planet searches. Um, and there's a few sort of firsts that we like to claim. The, the first one that we like to think that we found first is a, a gas giant planet in, in an Earth-like orbit back in 2000. Uh, 2003, we had a, uh, a gas giant planet with no inner planet uh, out beyond 3AU, what we thought of as the, the first uh, Jupiter analogue. Um, in uh, 2011, we found a, a Neptune mass planet in a 122-day orbit, so that's actually one of the, the longest uh, orbital periods for these very low mass planets that have been found to date. Um, also that year we found this system. Um, the problem with Doppler planet search work is that when you find a new planet, unlike the direct imaging people, you can't show anybody a picture and if you want to put out a press release, you have to go and get somebody to make what Hugh Jones always refers to as some surfboard art uh, to go out with your uh, press release. Fortunately in 2011 when we found uh, 38283b, which is in a 363.2 day orbit, so it's essentially a one year orbit. Uh, James Cameron had already made up some surfboard art for us, so we didn't have to go and recreate that. Uh, so that's a system that is essentially in uh, an almost exactly a one year orbit. As you'll see, we've had data on that that's gone back uh, almost the entire 15 years. It's just that it took us that long to be exactly sure that 363.2 days was actually the right answer and that we hadn't screwed up somewhere along the line. And of course we've also found 20782b, which is currently the eccentricity record holder amongst Doppler, um, amongst exoplanets. Um, just last year, you can't see it unfortunately on this very fuzzy display, there's three data points that we managed to get through the periastron passage uh, that really nailed down that eccentricity. Uh, and that really is one hell of an eccentric planetary system. So the focus from now on is to look at Jupiter analogues. Um, a couple of years ago, Rob Wittenmeyer uh, published a paper as a result of a lot of um, simulations on our data uh, that showed that we've got 3.3% of the stars in our sample uh, host Jupiter analogues, and when you put uh, take all the non-detections and inject fake signals in, you can show that at most 37% of the stars uh, could host a giant planet in the 3 to 6 AU range. And our focus for the, for the future is to essentially nail down this number to much higher levels of precision uh, by focusing on the 123 most stable stars in our program. I can't resist showing this. One of the things um, that you learn from 15 years of going up to the telescope and doing the same thing, typing the same commands night after night after night, uh, and then making the same screw-ups at least once or twice a year, is that you really want to try and automate your observing. And so all of our observing is run through this automated tool now that I, I started writing about seven or eight years ago. Uh, all of our targets are in a queue. They get loaded into the queue. You set either the signal to noise or the exposure time you want. It slews the, the telescope to the object. It starts the exposure. It finishes the exposure. It starts slewing the telescope to the next object while it's reading the detector out and reacquires the star so that the astronomer is stuck with doing only the most important tasks, like going and making coffee. Um, other programs that we've got running at the University of New South Wales in planet searching uh, and up at the Anglo-Australian Telescope are the ones that are being run by, uh, for example, Rob Wittenmeyer, who is complementing our search on primarily solar mass stars with a, a search on subgiant that is more massive but slightly evolved stars. Uh, and you should also have a look at uh, Rob's paper on eccentric uh, planets. Um, we found this system here, 159868b, uh, was known to have a planet. Uh, and as a result of continuously monitoring it, we found that it had a second planet. And when you actually put both of those planets in and did the fit, the first planet, which was originally an extremely eccentric planet, the eccentricity dropped down for the two planet fit considerably. Uh, and indeed, so Rob went away and did some simulations and found how many other systems that we think could have, uh, that we think have one eccentric planet could actually be multiple circular planets. And in our sample, we find that there are at least nine promising systems that are all dynamically stable for greater than 10 to the 8 years, where you could actually have two circular planets rather than one eccentric one. So you can go and have a look at his poster to find out more about the eccentricity being too high. Um, another um, poster from within our group is by um, 
Jonty Horner on uh, essentially checking your uh, dynamical facts. Uh, so if you're going to claim that you found a planetary system with two planets in it, it's worthwhile either plotting or simulating the orbits to make sure that they aren't ones like this, like in the QS Ver system, where it only takes 100 years before the planets bang into each other. So it's highly unlikely that that system is actually really as it was published. So why is Doppler... Why is this Doppler work so hard? Uh, it took many, many years, obviously, for the first Doppler detections to be made, and we're still banging away at it. It's still very hard to get below one meter per second precision. And the reason for that is that if you're working at a resolution of, let's say, 60,000, one meter per second is one five thousandth of a resolution element. So if you're trying to get down to one meter per second precision with that sort of uh, spectral resolution, your integrated signal to noise for the whole measurement needs to be uh, on the order of uh, 5,000. And if you want to then push a factor of 10 below that, then your integrated signal to noise needs to go up by a factor of 10, which means you need to collect 100 times more photons, and that gets very difficult to do, which is why you have to have access to either more and more telescope time or uh, larger and larger telescopes. The, the problem, the real problem, I think, and the under-realized un, under problem uh, in this game is that um, spectrographs are required to let light into them. If we didn't actually have to let light into spectrographs, they would work perfectly. Unfortunately, you have to let light into them, and that means you have to have a slit. Uh, and that then sets the resolution of your spectrograph, but you then have to measure where the light is sitting on that slit at the level of the precision you want. So in our case, at the level of roughly one five thousandths of the slit width. And that is incredibly difficult to do and is one of the real limiting factors in this game. That's why we have to use an iodine cell in our, obs in our observations. And that's why you have to use optical fiber feeds and lots of tricky scrambling techniques uh, if you're not using an iodine cell. And then, of course, you need to have a spectrograph that is sufficiently stable uh, and that you can calibrate it and have your reference and object point spread function on, on your spectrograph be the same to within that same one five thousandths of a PSF level and that that difference has to be constant with time and that's all incredibly difficult to do. And so um, that's why uh, there is an almost... Um, uh, a religious war between those who believe in using iodine uh, cells to calibrate your spectrographs and those who believe in using a uh, fiber system plus ultra stabilization. These are uh, these calibration wars, um, much like um, George Lucas's most recent movies, are long, pointless, and incredibly boring uh, and miss the biggest point, uh, which is that. Um, Iodine cell, everybody has to be able to calibrate the zero point. That's, that's the, the zero thought of problem. That's the, if you're not doing that, you're not even in the game. You have to be able to calibrate your spectrograph and how it changes with time. And you either do that by making something that essentially doesn't change with time, like HARPS, or you do it by using an iodine cell to highly calibrate the system. Then you have to calibrate the spectrograph aperture. So in the case of the fiber system, you have to do that by it, assuming that your fiber delivers a uniform spot into your spectrograph as a result of whatever scrambling techniques you can come up with. Or you use an iodine cell, which basically tells you what the illumination of the slit is. That's actually the biggest, single, most important function of the iodine cell in this game, is looking at what the spectrograph aperture function is. And so these are two quite separate problems, uh, and both of them have to be solved uh, to make these systems work. Uh, and indeed, to my mind, the smartest thing to do is to actually build one of these and then calibrate it with iodine, which I know is what one of the things that Deborah Fisher uh, is uh, wisely uh, trying to pursue and which we would like to pursue if we had a more stable spectrograph, uh, because that, I think, is the only way to actually move forward in this game. Relying on your fibers to just arbitrarily, perfectly scramble the spatial information is not a good idea. So one of the ways that we've been uh, improving our system at the AAT is with this system uh, called Cyclops. So rather than having a big fibre in which the star sits in the middle and wanders around and you hope that the fibre system scrambles the light and it comes out nice and smooth at the end, what we have is lots of little fibres. So we have a, an integral field unit like this uh, in a hexagonal format that's about two and a half arc seconds across. Each of these is about 0.6 arc seconds. So each of them sees a small fraction of the spatial information. 
at the, at the, uh, the focal plane of the telescope. And that then gets reformatted into a long slit. It's good for our crappy sight because our two and a half arc second aperture, which matches our seeing, gets turned into a nice high resolution slit. Uh, and then you can also play the game of having one of the fibers inject uh, a calibration lamp signal, which is what you can actually see here. This is the data from, from actually up at the telescope. Um, in this case, we actually had one arc second seeing, not two and a half, but we've got uh, a, a fiber arc here, uh, and then the actual uh, spectral information uh, coming out here. One of the nice things with that is that it then gives you a system. Iodine is wonderful, but it doesn't work on faint objects. Uh, and if you want to work on faint objects like transiting systems, uh, you need to basically rely on your uh, calibration to work properly. Uh, and so you can use the Cyclops 2 system to look at transiting systems like Hat South 3B, uh, which is, uh, you can see on Daniel Bayliss's poster. Uh, and I can't resist showing this plot. This is one of the most interesting plots I've seen in a long time. It's in Daniel's uh, paper on Hat South 3B. This is a plot of the number density of objects as a function of radius and mass from transiting systems. And it's interesting to me that there is a relatively tight relationship for the more massive planets. There is a gap here that can't possibly be a result of a selection effect. And then there's this big broad distribution down at low masses. I don't know what that's all about. You can do Rossiter McLaughlin work with this system and go and have a look at Brett Addison's paper where he's done exactly that. Uh, Graham Salter has got a paper which has already been referred to by one of the previous session organizers on using um, Nikki to look for companions to the, the stars that we know from our Doppler search have long period planets. We're going to try and build a new spectrograph, uh, which we're calling Veloce. Uh, and if anybody wants to know about that, uh, come and ask me. And finally, I'll finish up by saying that we also want to do a new survey, which I think you should all be very interested in, uh, called FunnelWeb. Uh, there is a new spectrograph being built called Taipan on the UK Schmidt Telescope. Uh, which is using a new revolutionary multi-object uh, technology uh, called star bugs that can position fibers at a focal plane all independently, all at the same time. Uh, and that means it's perfect for doing an idea that Mike Ireland came up with, which is to observe all 2 million stars in the southern hemisphere down to about 12th magnitude uh, and get a spectral typing catalog for everything. Uh, so if you want to know where the young stars are in the southern hemisphere, Funnel Web will tell you. Uh, and uh, I think the most important use of this is going to be that we can help TESS avoid the Kepler mistake. I'm continually amazed that with only 150,000 stars in the Kepler input catalogue, they didn't go and get a spectrum of every single one beforehand. Uh, this can help make sure that TESS doesn't make that mistake. So if anybody's interested in that or interested in helping us get funding for that, you can come and talk to me and I'll stop there. Thanks, Matthew. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Any questions? There you go. Happy audience. <laughs> Excellent stuff. Oh, sorry. Yes, there is one. Stan. Stan Matcher from Stony Brook. Uh, Funnel Web sounds awfully exciting. Um, what kind of radio velocities are you going to get on all these two million stars? So the, um, the, the, the system is, is being designed by extragalactic astronomers for some sort of cosmetology rubbish. I don't know what it's all about. Um, as a result of which, um, and due to the, the shortage of money, um, it will only have a resolution of about two and a half thousand. So the, the radial velocity precision you know, is only probably going to be sort of 10 metres a second at best. Um, which will be enough for, you know, giving you a rough idea of galactic populations, but, you know, you're not going to be doing precision radial velocities with it. 10 kilometers per second. Sorry? 10 kilometers per second. Yeah, sorry, 10 kilometers per second. Okay, and Bruce right at the very back, please. Last question. Um, insane ideas to, to get well down below the Earth detection threshold. Do you think the stars are going to support that? Or? I, think that the, I, I think that the only way you will ever know is going to be to suck it and see. Um, at the moment, it's not obvious that the, um, 
that the precision that's being delivered, uh, we are, we're certainly seeing stellar variability uh, and there are various tricks for, for trying to suppress it or average over it. Uh, I don't think we've reached the limits of what those tricks can do. And the other thing is that um, variability is largely you know, a, a random phenomenon. Some stars are more active than others and you can always go hunting for the things that, you know, that happen to have the most that are the most intrinsically stable stars for doing, playing this game. So I don't think we've exhausted the opportunities, but you're right, it is an issue that you need to think about. Thank, let's all thank Chris again.